Okay. We are going to continue talking about, I'm pretty sure we won't get to asteroids today, but we'll at least continue with Venus and then get to Mars. Yes. What is what? I still didn't hear you. What is the um, blue I was actually looking at that and wondering myself, it could be refraction, you know, the light going through the atmosphere and refracting and getting some scattering to make it look blue just for the same way that our atmosphere looks blue. Or it could be that it's something completely different and I don't know. So I was wondering that too, though. I like looking at these pictures of Venus and Mars. These are the two planets that are most similar to Earth. In terms of size, which one of these is closer in size to the Earth? Venus. Venus is... It's what somewhere in the ballpark of 93 percent of the earth's mass it's it's really similar to the earth's size it's pretty much negligible. well it's not negligible but it's it's small mars is a fair amount smaller i think it's only like two-thirds the size of the earth so mars is a fair amount smaller things that are interesting to compare here is that is an ice cap on mars mars has of course all planets are going to have poles because they're all rotating. And Mars has ice at its poles. Of course, it has to be wintertime for there to be a nice big ice cap. And so there's an ice cap here that, that seasonally melts. One of the things about that ice cap, though, is it's, it's not made of water ice as much as it is dry ice. It's just carbon dioxide. And, well, we'll see both of these, but you can see some distinct differences. This one here of Venus, it just looks like it's hot, like it's molten. Now, it's not really molten, but we'll see it's very hot there. Mars, at its hottest, Mars is beautiful, just like we have right now today. Right? I love the temperatures we're having right now. But at its coldest, Mars is really cold. At its coldest, Venus is still super, super hot. What makes the difference? It's the atmosphere, greenhouse effect. Now, Venus here, this picture, this is taken with radio mapping of the surface because clouds cover the surface. You can't see the surface. So this is radio mapping. And if you see at the bottom, you can see here, they didn't get that mapped very well. There are regions that they didn't get mapped at all. This is stitching together many pictures it is not an artist rendition or artist rendering as the flat earthers would have you believe anytime it says that it's you know computer image um, here's some pictures that were taken on the surface of venus so these are actual real photographs of the surface of venus do you ever wonder what these little things here are Yeah, because <laughs> the first time I looked at it, I was like, oh my goodness, intelligent life was there before. No, just the Russians with their spacecraft that took this picture. It looks like him. It looks like it what? Look well, anyway, so that, that's a picture of the terrain. Looks kind of broken up. And notice here the temperature I actually put down there. It's very hot, hot enough to melt lead, hot enough to make most metals soft at the very least. I don't know how you guys feel about the Twin Towers, but some people have said, you know, the the diesel doesn't burn hot enough to melt That's it metal. Wasn't diesel. It's jet fuel. That's or not diesel, okay, kerosene, whatever jet fuel is essentially. I thought it was basically diesel. No, but, no, jet fuel is not. It's a beam. It wasn't even that. It got hot enough to where they can bend. Yeah, it only doesn't have to get hot enough to melt. It just has to get hot enough to weaken. <laughs> and. And so it would definitely weaken your spacecraft and the gases, the sulfuric acid. What is iron? I don't know. I think it's a lot higher. The, it, it's somewhere in the ballpark of 1500. So about twice that. So iron? No. It would still be softened. Okay. So because of the temperature, pressure, and atmosphere, their longest spacecraft lasted less than two hours. Wait, what's that thing? Okay. I don't know. <laughs> what what was that, Alden? Okay. Less, less, less than two hours? Less than. Less than. I was like, okay. 
you don't want to be a manned, you know, spacecraft to Venus. It's like, uh, how much money did they spend on that? A lot. Well, it wasn't going to come home anyway. True, but still. Okay, so looking at the surface of Venus, here's maps showing the two surfaces, you know, the front side and the back side. These colors are clearly false colors. The surface of Venus, it's, you know, cloud covered, very hazy, yellowish. These colors here are to represent what it might look like if it was a planet with the atmosphere like Earth. Like, could Venus have an atmosphere like Earth? If it had the right gases? Yes. And so the blue regions are the low regions that would be oceans if it was Earth. And green is, you know, middle elevations where you would have nice greenish areas. And then the more reddish is the mountainous regions where you'd have less foliage again. So you can look at it and get some elevation ideas. And of course, here's the actual mapping of colors to elevation. And it's really convenient how the color, whoops, the color up here, the color down here is the same. <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice feature. And so you notice the names Aphrodite, like, like the band, the Mighty Aphrodites, right? Yeah, didn't think so. Um, all of these, except for Was there two, there's one that's not main, named after a woman, there's the other. Everything else is named after females. I'm pretty sure. Oh, in the yeah, sorry. Yeah, you're going to say Lakshmi? Yes, Lakshmi is a woman. No, it's not a woman. Oh, Ishtar. Yeah, that's also a woman. Yes. So, you know, it's it's got an interesting, um, some interesting features. Lots of volcanic activity. Nice job. Is, is visible on the surface. Not any active volcanoes right now, as far as I know. But signs of volcanic activity with craters from impacts and all kinds of things. These here are called pancake domes. These pancake domes are a lot like shield volcanoes on Earth. How many people know what a shield volcano is on Earth? Russell does. Okay, shield volcanoes are volcanoes that form when you have a magma that flows. You have basically two types of magma. Three well, basically two types. There's a continuous spectrum, but they break it into felsic and mafic. And the difference is the, um, the composition of, um, of minerals. One has more feldspar, so it's felsic. Um, the one is mafic. I can't remember um, exactly what it has. But the fundamental difference that we care about for this purpose is that one of them flows like molasses, the other one doesn't. The other one doesn't flow very well, so it builds up high pressures and you tend to have just catastrophic explosions when it breaks through and you have lots of gas build up. But one that flows kind of like molasses, it comes out and oozes down to the ocean. And so probably you can remember a place on Earth where we see Magma come out of the volcano. It's not this big violent explosion. It's just magma comes out and flows to the ocean. Where do we see that on Earth? I just don't know. <laughs> you asked to go to an obscure place. Hawaii is the place that most of us would have thought of. The Hawaiian Islands are shield volcanoes. They're volcanoes where the magma comes up from a hot spot deep within the Earth, and then it just flows out and forms flat mountains. Not tall mountains, but flat for the most part. Now we'll see, in contradiction to what I just said, the tallest mountain on Earth is Mauna Kea, which is one of the Hawaiian Islands. But the, these here are thought to be a lot like shield volcanoes. They're 10 times bigger, roughly, than shield volcanoes on Earth. So they're really big, the lava flows. But they think that they are, you know, just like the Hawaiian Islands is all one hot spot with the 
crust having gone over and punched a hole here and then punched a hole here and so on. That this here is the same type of thing probably with one hot spot that's come up multiple places to make these pancake domes. They, there's also signs of fractured surfaces on Venus, but getting to the most interesting thing to me about Venus is its orbit. Now its orbit is normal, but its rotation is not. If you look at the picture, what you notice is number one, its rotation, its orbit is going counterclockwise, but its rotation is going clockwise. They're opposite directions. It's the only planet in the solar system that does that. And if you look at it even care more carefully, you notice that in the time that's done a little bit, a little bit more than half a rotation, it's gone halfway around, more than halfway around actually, the planet. It takes 243 days to do one complete rotation. 243 Earth days to do, no, to do one rotation, which is actually about the same as one orbit. Because you notice here, that's about, it's not exactly halfway, you know, here's, whoops. If that was a straight line, okay, I've got a straight line tool. I got it selected now. So there's a straight line, right? So it's done a little more, little bit more than half of a an orbit here, and it's done a little less than half of a rotation. How many days have occurred in the picture shown here? How many days as measured on Venus, I should say, not as measured on Earth? Uh, almost Going from noon to noon is not just almost. Oh, I thought you said like from the line. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So it's depicting one full day. It does just under half of a rotation, just over half of an orbit and it's one full day because the rotation is opposite to the orbit direction you have one more day per orbit than you have rotations so you would have roughly two days per orbit because of the backward rotation and the very slow rate so that that slow rate has some implications i highlighted in red one of these implications the slow rotation creates almost no magnetic field. What were the three things that we needed to create our magnetic field? Rotation, convection, and That's right. So if we look at this with our understanding of Venus, now Venus, roughly the size of Earth. Surface of Venus is much hotter than the surface of Earth. Because the surface is much hotter, the cooling at the center of the planet should be less than Earth has. So if it's roughly the same size as the Earth and has less cooling, it's got to have a molten core if it's like Earth. We can take our Earth knowledge and apply it. It's got to have a molten core, so it must have a conducting fluid there in the center. Why conducting? Well, if it's like Earth, it's going to have metals in the core. Is it more or less than the core? It's less. So we have conducting fluid, and this statement in red says slow rotation creates almost no magnetic field. But models and computer simulations confirm that its rate of rotation is still fast enough that it should make a magnetic field, and yet Venus doesn't have one. And so it has fast enough rotation, it has conducting fluid, What's the, what must it be missing? It must be missing the convection. It must be because the surface is so hot 
you don't have a big enough temperature gradient in the core, difference in temperature, to create hotter stuff that floats up among the colder stuff. It must be all pretty uniform in temperature. So if we made the so if we cool off the surface, we need some magnetic. So if we cool off the surface, it would probably cause magnetic field to appear. Yeah. So that's you know applying our knowledge of the Earth to Venus, giving us then a conclusion. We we haven't been inside. We don't know what's going on in Venus anymore than we know what's going on in Earth. But we can draw these conclusions. And of course, I mentioned this last class period, tidal breaking could not have produced this slow backward rotation because tidal breaking slows the rotation. It doesn't change the direction of the rotation. Now, Venus's magneto tail, this is not in the textbook. Venus doesn't have a magnetic field. The Earth has a magnetic field. So that picture with the blue, that's depicting the Earth with its magnetic field. And normally when we think about the Earth's magnetic field, we think about the magnetic field when you're close in. So we think about the magnetic field in this area, basically. And so it's rather symmetrical. It's not perfectly symmetric. It's not perfectly symmetric. So if you stand out here with a perfect compass, that compass is going to vary throughout the day because as the Earth rotates, you're going to be going from the side facing the sun during the daylight hours to the side away from the sun in the nighttime hours. And you notice the magnetic field is compressed on the side facing the sun and it's elongated on the side, side away from the sun. The elongated side is the side that's called the magneto tail. What is the compass is not what it is? Um, a compass would not work because it has no magnetic field. That's correct. What it work on Mars? What it work on Mars? Mars has a weak and very chain. Um, it's like locked into the ground more than it is a planet wide, and so your compass would not be beneficial for navigation. It would do things that wouldn't be beneficial for navigation. Okay, so first of all, let me just quickly explain why we have the shape outside of my red circle for the magnetosphere. The sun is blowing off copious amounts of material. Among that are things like protons. Protons come flying towards, protons have a positive charge. Those protons come toward our magnetic field and they interact with the magnetic field. A charged particle like a proton, when it enters the magnetic field, if it's moving, there's gonna be a force perpendicular to the direction of the velocity, the direction it's traveling, and the direction of the magnetic field. This is really good for us on Earth because we have a magnetic field that's going, pointing north to south, wait, no, it's coming out of the south pole, south to north out there. And so charged particles come in and they get deflected like that or like that. So our magnetic field protects us from receiving those charged particles. So when we go walking outside, or inside for that matter, we don't have to worry about receiving large amounts of charged particle radiation from the sun. If we go outside of the Earth's magnetic field, we do have to worry about that. But of course, we get to the second. If you go further north or south, you're not having the charged particles from the sun going perpendicular anymore. If the charged particle comes like this, it goes like this and spirals around and comes on in. And so near the poles, you do get charged particles coming into the atmosphere. And that's actually what's responsible for things like the auroras, the northern and southern lights, is the charged particles entering the atmosphere. Okay, so you have a question. Yeah. Um, how far outside or how far into the Earth magnetic field have manned space missions gone? You know, do, do they have to, when they do a manned space mission, do they have to take into account people being out in space with charged particles flying around? Or okay, let's talk conspiracy theories since you broached the topic. Okay. There are these things we call the Van Allen belts. These were the whole Van Allen belts because it was Van Allen who came up with the idea that these charged particles from the solar wind, when they come in, there are certain regions where those charged particles 
will end up just doing little spirals and staying in place. And so you get a lot of charged particles spiraling in the same region. And so if you go through a Van Allen belt, you're going to get a very large amount of radiation. This radiation being basically protons flying through your body. And so when the U.S., you know, good old um, President Kennedy said, we're going to send man to the moon and the other things, or something like that. And so when they sent a manned mission to the moon, everybody said, no, you didn't. There's still a lot of people who say, no, you didn't. There are some people who say, well, sure, now we can do it. But originally when they said they did it, they didn't do it. And what were their evidences? Have you guys seen all these conspiracy sites about man not going to the moon? <laughs> I believe that as much as um, of how Earth is flat. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you, but going on with the story, there, there are a number of things people will point to. Some of them are ludicrous. Things like the flag appears to wave, and if there's no air, clearly the flag can't wave. True? True. Except the flag was on a telescoping um, pole with another telescoping arm out here to hold it out because clearly the flag is not going to stay up when there's no wind. And the thing, without having any air to dampen it, will sit here, you put it in the ground, and vibrate on its own for a long period of time. And so it was that plus you know, the fact that it was holding up that makes it look like it might be waving. It's not. I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty simple explanation. Another one is they found a rock, and that rock has this, you know, in, in NASA pictures from the moon, and that rock, rock has something that looks like this on the side of it. They said, see, that's a prop designation, that that was prop C from the prop department down in Hollywood where they filmed the fake moon landing. And then there were the Russians who said something much more reasonable than those two. Oh, another one, yeah, let's not talk about the other things. The Russians said, you know, those Van Allen belts, would be deadly to humans if they went through them. There's no way you sent humans there because you would have killed them on the way. And the US government in response said, no, we actually considered that. They were only in Van Allen belts for about five minutes. So they received a large dose during that five minutes, but it was a, sh a short enough time period that you know, it didn't cause so much cell death. Um, radiation is dangerous, right? Why is it dangerous? If you charge particles going through the body, or if you have ionizing radiation, well, yeah, ionizing radiation. If you have high frequency waves, waves that have a high enough frequency that photons are like 10 electron volts or more, that's in the ultraviolet range, farther ultraviolet, then it can break bonds in molecules in your body. And if it breaks bonds in DNA, well, then you might have a problem. So if you break bond in DNA, most of the time that bond just reforms and everything's all off the door. But a small percentage of the time, the bond reforms incorrectly. And if it reforms incorrectly, then you have a mutation. And most of the time, those are just going to kill the cell. You know, cell dies, gone, no problem. A little bit of the time, it's actually viable. The cell continues on as a mutant cell. That's when you have problems. If that mutant cell rapidly reproduces, you have cancer. So when you receive a large dosage, the amount of cells that have mutations, the amount of cells that die, those go up. And if you get a high enough dosage, you kill enough cells that your body can't regenerate cells as fast as they're dying. And then you get radiation sickness. You might see pictures of people with, you know, like skin sloughing off type things and they die from the radiation sickness. It's because they had so many cells in their bodies killed, their body couldn't keep up with it. Um, the other problem is the mutations. If you don't have enough radiation to kill you from radiation sickness, you might have mutations and get cancer somewhere further on down the line. You had a question, Alder? Um, is there anything revolving around the moon? Anything what? Like revolving around the moon. Orbiting the moon? Um, not that I'm aware of. I did see an article today about a second moon of the Earth. Has anybody seen articles about the second moon of the Earth? Ben Tyner was the one who reposted the article. Of course, Ben's statement, I think, was, that's not a moon. 
there is another object that has a period of orbit around the sun that's 365.97 days. So its period for orbit the sun is not the same as ours, but it's close, and it has an eccentric orbit. So sometimes it's farther from the sun, and sometimes it's closer. And thus, we actually do have some, sometimes we're ahead, sometimes it's ahead. So you could, you could view it as orbiting us, but the period of orbit is you know, on the order of a year-ish. Um, so I thought that would be an interesting topic, especially if you ask me, moon of Mars. Uh, or not Mars, it's the moon. Moon of the moon. Okay, so back to this. The interaction between the charged particles in the magnetic field puts a force on the magnetic field, and so that compresses the front end. And as the charged particles stream by, it elongates the tail, creating that magneto tail. Now, Venus, without a magnetic field, it's still going to disrupt the flow of the charged particles because, you know, they hit it. They hit its atmosphere. And so the motion of those charged particles around actually creates a magneto tail. So it's interesting that it has no planet-wide magnetic field, but it still has a magneto tail. Okay, that was a long time for something that's not even in your book. If it's not in your book, it's not tested on. But I think it's really cool to know. Now, things about like the Van Allen belts and stuff, that stuff is in the book. Let's go to Mars. Yeah, <laughs> I wish. So Mars... Mars has been steadied more than any planet except for, of course, Earth. And we have rovers on Mars right now studying what's up there. And so when we look at Mars, we see some, some pretty cool features. One of the first things about Mars that we don't see at all in these pictures are the uh, um, cannoli. They thought they looked like canals. And so they thought that people must live on Mars and had made these canals. Um, when we actually got higher resolution pictures of Mars, what looked like canals became not at all looking like canals, just like normal features. But it early on got the idea going in people's heads that there was intelligent life on Mars. And so that's why, you know, Mars attacks, Mars is this, Mars is that. There has been a long history of people suggesting that there are intelligent species on Mars. If you look at the surface of Mars, to me that is a lot more noteworthy than the surface of Venus. Right? I look there and I see some cool features. Like you see that Valles Marineris. I, I don't know how you're supposed to pronounce marinara sauce and marineris differently, but that's the Mariner Valley, right? Mariner, the spacecraft that first visited. We'll see Valles Marineris in another couple slides, but it is a huge canyon. It's the biggest canyon in the solar system. It dwarfs the Grand Canyon. Its length is equal to the length of the entire United States. And it's also a fair amount deeper than the Grand Canyon. You have, well, just getting right to it. What would create that? What, cre what do we believe created the Earth's Grand Canyon? Water erosion. Is there water on Mars? I mean, there's ice, but I don't say water. Okay, so there is H2O ice. There are trace amounts of H2O in the atmosphere. They've never found liquid water. Now I have like eight slides devoted to water. But they've never found liquid water. But in the past, it could have had liquid water. But the study of this suggests that that's not the origin of Valles Marineris. The suggestion that scientists believe to be true is that it is essentially a crack that you would get from like plate tectonics or something. That said, there is no evidence for a current um, plate tectonic action. In fact, the surface of Mars is very hard. If you look on the left there, far left, you have Olympus Mons, Mount Olympus. Mount Olympus there is the tallest mountain in the solar system. So you have the tallest mountain in the solar system, you have the largest canyon in the solar system. Once again, I'll actually wait to talk about Olympus Mons until I get to the side because it's really cool. The other side of Mars is far less interesting. You have 
Hellas Planitium. What, do you, what does Hellas mean? It's a word that the Greeks use about themselves. For talking about themselves, yes. To me, being a Californian, I kind of think it's, you know, kind of like, well, that's hella cool. That's a, that's a hella plane. But, but that's not what it is. It's the Greek plane. And up here, Utopia Planitia. Well, that would be the ideal place to live, apparently. And so I had to put this in as a clicker question just to make sure you, you all understand. What does Hellas Planitia mean? Okay. We, we had, I don't know, sometimes. <laughs> awesome plant. You guys know I'm from California, right? Do you know the original name for San Francisco? It's... I, I don't remember if there is an E here or not. I don't think there is. Man, maybe. I don't know. Maybe there's an E there. Herba Buena, right? There's Herba Buena Island there. So my sister and I did the old uh, harbor cruise one day, and the, the guy who's given it was very, very pleased to say, yes, indeed, San Francisco was originally called the beautiful herb. Right. The hippie movement was never far from San Francisco. Um, that is not, of course, what Hellas Phoenicia means. It doesn't mean awesome plant. It means Greek plain. Not very plain. Not very cold place. All right. So here is a picture of Valdes Marineris. And... We actually have really good resolution pictures of Mars, right? Because we have all the orbiters and whatnot. And so you can see a lot of detail here. And you see that this does not look like the walls of the Grand Canyon when you look at the walls. And so that's part of the reason why I say, no, that's, that's not an erosional feature. That's more of a feature of some kind of, well, in this case, not uplift, but a rift that it's been pushed apart. Um, well, yeah, it, it's, it's as long. I, I see the word here is wide, but yeah, it, it's, you can measure wide two ways. I'm this wide. Okay. <clears throat> Olympus Mons, Mount Olympus. Now, most people don't realize that Mount Everest is not the tallest mountain on earth. What is special about Mount Everest? It's the highest point. The highest point on earth. It has the highest elevation. But the base of the mountain is much higher than the base of Mauna Kea. Mauna Kea's base is underwater. Mauna Kea is so heavy that it has a moat. That is, it's shrunk, air shrunk. It's sunk down into the earth. So the ocean floor comes up, sinks down because of its heavy load, and then goes up. And so measured from its base to its peak, Mauna Kea is just a little bit taller than Mount Everest. You can see here the numbers, 32,696 feet versus 29,035 feet. So that's the tallest mountain that we have on Earth, Mauna Kea. The tallest mountain on Venus is Maxwell Montes, which is similar in height to Mauna Kea. It's a little bit higher. And just for reference here, we have the elevation at which passenger jets fly is high enough that a passenger jet could fly over Mount Everest with ease, actually, be you know, more than a mile above the top of Mount Everest. But if we go to Olympus Mons on Mars, it is over twice the height of Mauna Kea. So it's very, very tall. 
Now, of course, the acceleration of gravity on Mars is not as strong as the acceleration of gravity on the Earth because it has less mass. But a mountain that big should have a crushing weight. And on Earth, we saw, or we saw, I just told you, Mauna Kea actually has, has sunk down into the Earth. But Olympus Mons has not sunk into Mars. The crust has remained stiff underneath it. So scientists look at this and they say, well, for the crust to have not sunk underneath that much weight, it must have a very hard crust. That crust must be very deep. And so they presume a very thick crust for Mars based on this. And, you know, to me, it stands to reason. Um, notice the age, about 250 million years old. If you believe in evolution, where's 250 million years in the evolutionary scheme? No, it's very long. Evolutionary theory proposes that the Cambrian explosion was around, I think it's around 540 million years ago. And this would be, um, the 250 million years would be before the Cretaceous period, I believe. So you'd be talking like Pennsylvanian or something like that for the, um, so, so pre-dinosaur era for the Earth. So that's, that's old. Other things we find on Mars. Dunes. You look at those. Well, that looks like a sand dune, right? Totally. Is it sand dune? <laughs> totally. You have lots of wind storms on Mars, and so it pushes the sand around to make these dunes. So nothing odd about that. One of the normal surface features. You've got the polar ice caps. It's tilted 25 degrees. How much is the Earth tilted? It's about 23 and a half degrees, 23.4 degrees for Earth. So it's tilted just a little tiny bit more than the Earth, which means it's going to have seasonal variation that's really kind of similar to what the Earth has in terms of more sunlight, less sunlight. And so it forms um, polar ice caps that go through freeze-melt cycles. And notice the polar caps are composed mostly of water ice, but then you have the important thing covered by dry ice. So there is water ice encapsulated in that. How in the world do they know there's water ice there? The, the rovers haven't been there to sample it. So how do they know? They just assume. They just assume. No, that's not it. Go ahead, Max. Okay, well, but that's not the atmosphere that's looking at the surface. What they actually do is they can measure the spectra, just like we saw the spectra of gases. They can measure the spectra of light that gets absorbed by the material there to get information about the elements present in the ice cap. So it's similar to the way we identified the gases of the sun. Okay, had to separate this by a slide. What is the tallest mountain in the solar system? All right, stopping it now before anybody changes their vote. Andy Plater's guys. Well, there was somebody that had Mount Everest on there, I think, and I know somebody started with Maxwell Montes. Where is this found? That's found on Venus. How does it compare in elevation or in height to the tallest mountains on Earth? It's just a slight amount taller than the tallest mountains on Earth. So that's on Venus, and that's not the winner, even though it's taller than anything on Earth. Mount Everest. What what Tioni tell us was special about Mount Everest? They didn't listen to you, Tioni. It's the highest point. It's 
the highest elevation on Earth. What about Mauna Kea? Did we talk about Mauna Loa? Nope. Just another Hawaiian island or Hawaiian mountain. How does it compare with the other Is it a lot shorter? Um, Mauna Loa is also large, but I don't know how tall. Olympus Mons then was the winner at. 82,000 some feet. All right. Now talking about water. Do you remember what I told you about former Vice President Dan Quayle and water on Mars? Wasn't it the one that said like nosy greenhouse effect or something like that? Well, no. He said, well, we're spending all this money to explore Mars because we're looking for water. And if we find water, then there's oxygen. If there's oxygen, then we can breathe and live on Mars. Right. Very wrong. But why do we then spend all the money? You know, I, like I said, I'm sure he was briefed on this and just didn't understand the briefing. We spend all the money looking for water on Mars because we understand water as a necessary component for there to be life. You have to have water. You have to have certain nutrients. You have to have a source of energy. And so if they can find water, then that makes it feasible that there could potentially have been or still is life on Mars. So that's really why they're looking so hard for water. And so you look and you look at that picture, that certainly looks like water features. Right? It looks like you had water streaming down a mountainside creating those goalies, right? And so we're going to look at some pictures here that seem to indicate water on Mars in the past. So things that look like dry riverbeds, splash craters, gullies and crater waters, walls, salts that only appear in aqueous situations on Earth. So here's a picture. Does that, does that look like it might have had water flowing? Yeah, I mean, if... If you had water flowing like this, whatever that thing is separates the water, the water flows around and comes back. Yeah, that looks like features that we form on Earth from water flow. This here is supposed to look like, you know, you had ice flows, that is um, sheets of ice floating across the surface, kind of like what glaciers would do on Earth. Splash craters, here you see a crater, something impacted there. And you look out here, and that looks like you had muddy dirt. Something fell in and splashed stuff out. I mean, I would have a hard time saying that doesn't look like a water feature. And finally, well, next to finally, but finally for my pictures, this here looks like you had water running down the sides of the, the mountain here. As scientists have studied these, different things bring different conclusions. You know, what caused this? One of the ideas is that under the surface of Mars, there's a lot of frozen water, maybe holding back a dam of liquid water, and that occasionally the temperatures get high enough for that frozen water to melt and whoosh, you have a flash flood. That's one idea. But there are other alternate theories that maybe you had, you know, something like a, a fluid flow that wasn't water, um, maybe even wind to cause features like this. But the real, the real key that has people 100% convinced of water is salts. We have salts that are on earth can only form, well, salt, you take an acid and a base, you combine them and you precipitate out an ionic solid that we call a salt and water. But it, it can only be done in an aqueous solution. And they find salts that precipitate from bringing the acid and the base together that can only be formed, at least on Earth, if you have a liquid water. So scientists have concluded there must, 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 must have been liquid water 
at some point on the surface of Mars, but not now. Hence, whoops, wrong class. Have we detected flowing water on Mars? Okay, three that said no, eight that said yes. I forgot to have anyone answer questions so far, but this time I will, and the lucky person is Russell. Russell, have we detected flowing water on Mars? No, we detected that it had flowing waters at one point. Perfect answer. No, we have not, but we have detected solid evidence that at one point it did have flowing waters. So if it had flowing waters at one point and it does not have flowing waters now, where'd they go? One of those two. They've either been frozen somewhere under the ground or they've evaporated, gone up and escaped the atmosphere. So here, here's your answer. Some may be trapped just below the surface is permafrost. That's the frozen. Locked in mineral compounds, that's another option. Most probably escaped to space, that's the other option that Aldwin gave us. So, good answer. Yeah, pay attention. Okay, now looking at the surface of Mars, that's what we call rusty looking because it's rusty. Mars has a, an orange hue because you have oxidized iron. Rust. So it gives its color. You, you also have dirt on Earth that has that color from having oxidized iron in it. It's a dry, dusty place because you don't have any liquid water. Um, you have rocks everywhere. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's really curious. You'll have pictures like a rover takes a picture, and then takes another picture of the same place, and a rock that was there disappears. Have you guys seen any of those? No. Oh, you should look for them. The conspiracy people jump all over that. They say, aha, there was an alien that came and picked up that rock, and that's why it's not there. And then you're like, but why didn't we see the alien in the picture? Well, I don't know. But it's, it's fun to, I mean, NASA's explanation is it must have been a wind that, you know, made it move. That's their explanation because how she can explain it. So what's the atmosphere like on Mars? 95% carbon dioxide. Now you might say, especially if you're Al Gore, oh, 95% carbon dioxide, that's a greenhouse gas. We're going to have a runaway greenhouse effect. This is not something we can manage or handle. Those are, those are like, like, yes, I mean, I um, yes, yes. So why is it a problem on Venus but not here? Yeah, because it's a really thin atmosphere. You know, I could have my estate is comprised 100% of stocks in Yahoo. And, and, and that could be just one stock. You know, I'm not wealthy just because I have everything in Yahoo stock, but I only have one. I don't know. I just chose something. I was going to say Berkshire Hathaway, but if you have even one share of Berkshire Hathaway, you're not doing so bad. Um, it's actually down to like 200. 14,000 a share right now? 225, I think. No, time. no. I, I inherited them. <laughs> so I track it every day. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's a 214, believe me. It was up to 229 when we inherited them. Actually, yeah, we inherited two. Um, so there's just not that much atmosphere. The atmosphere is about 1 one hundredth as much as we have on earth. If that atmosphere was 100% oxygen, how would we do for breathing? If it's just as thick, but 100% oxygen. It would be on fire. No. You, well, first of all, you wouldn't be able to breathe. 100% oxygen at 1 100th, what we have here, 
we can't breed that. And so it's just not very much. Notice here it says about 0.6% the pressure that we have on Earth. 0.6%. Less than 1 100th the atmospheric pressure. Very, very low pressure. It does have clouds with water, ice, and carbon dioxide ice floating in the sky. That's got to be pretty. Um, doesn't rain, but sometimes it snows. The coldest temperature you get there, that's really darn cold, right? Minus 153 degrees Celsius. But the highest temperature, 20 degrees Celsius, that's like 68 degrees Fahrenheit. That's really comfortable. So its highs are fine when the sun is shining. Notice that range. That range of temperatures is not as big as the range that you have on Mercury. Why would Mercury have a bigger range in temperatures? It has no atmosphere. It has no atmosphere. So it has nothing to cause energy to flow around. So your, your coldest temperature on Mars should be colder than the coldest temperature on Mercury if there was no atmosphere issue. But because you have a little bit of atmosphere on Mars, you have a little bit of circulation that makes it so it doesn't get as cold on Mars as it does on Mercury, even though it's much farther from the sun. Um, it doesn't get as hot on Mars, but that's not surprising because it's a lot farther from the sun as well. Oh, shoot, we're out of time. Okay, don't worry about answering this. I didn't, didn't put it there. I have to end with this. An actual photograph sent back in... I think 1971, people saw that and they said, I knew it, I knew it, there were aliens living on Mars because they made this statue of a face. And in fact, I don't have enough size on this. I thought I did, I was looking at another picture. But there are things over here that look like pyramids and they say, see, see, they had a village there. They built pyramids. It's just like, you know, down in Egypt where you have, you know, the, the pyramids and the sphinx. If it was sad because we're all going through the same thing over and over again. <laughs> well, they, I don't know, if you have to go, you just have to go. They went back and specifically took more detailed photographs of this site just so they could understand better. Because, I mean, if it is really a, a face that's been carved there, we'd want to know. It turns out it's fairly nondescript mountain. It was just a random where the shadows were that made it look like a face. So if you are curious, I put some links there. The name of the place is Cydonia.